Marxists, Zionists, Islamic extremists. What do they have in common that Christians might do well to duplicate? Welcome back, everybody. With a cold opening like that, we have to dive in and explain, I think. However, before we get there, please, if you're finding value in these uh, in these podcasts, in the ministry, if you can, I know it's a light lift, but it's still something I want to focus on and ask. Please, comment, like, and subscribe. That's it. Three little things, comment, like, and subscribe. So, here we go. When it comes to certain groups, organizations, uh, certain movements, certain ideologies, there are things that uh, we can glean as Christians, people in the kingdom of God. Small little bits that we can glean from some of these organizations some of these ideologies, some of these movements, and incorporate into our view, the way we operate within the kingdom of God. Now, these are not things that are unscriptural. This isn't like, oh, well, this group over here is really doing really, really great things through violence and fear. Let's do that. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I am talking about things that they are scriptural. They are part of the biblical mandate, they are part of the sphere within the kingdom of God, but it might be something that Christians don't often take advantage of, or something that they have lost, or something that gets uh, muddied out. And uh, what am I, what am I talking about? Well, first, let's define some terms. Uh, Marxists. I think you probably have heard that term. You probably are familiar with that ideology. It is basically a uh, socio-politico-economic ideology. It is very much us versus them. It is very uh, anti-God, very uh, absent of God, atheistic in its in its core. And it, when it originally came about with Karl Marx, right? It comes from his name, Karl Marx, Marxist. But it was uh, overthrowing the current order, and the current order happened to be, the way they defined it, was like the, the working class versus the, the bourgeois, the, the dirty, evil, nasty capitalists. And uh, they created a, a sort of a us versus them, uh, we need to overthrow and take over, and then it's, it's going to be, you know, wonderful and, and so rosy and perfect, and... They have a very uh, utopian view. If we you, utopia is is ahead, if we can just be in charge and overthrow and tear down everything that's existing, well, their utopian view uh, they took over in many places around the world in the nineteen uh, hundreds, and uh, the body count is roughly a hundred million people inside of a century uh, between places like China with Mao. Uh, Russia with Stalin, Lenin, those guys, and then you th you pepper that with a few places like uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, and again, around the world. This ideology was responsible, an atheistic, utopian ideology was responsible for uh, tens of millions of people dying, right? Intentionally dying, killing them, offing them, starving them torturing them, 
It was gruesome and terrible. Uh, so that's Marxism for you. And today we have cultural Marxism. We have an us versus them. We have these uh, folks out there, groups like BLM, groups like, uh, well, I mean, Antifa and all these different places that are, uh, they're all about, listen to the language of tearing down the current order, the current structures, the uh, horrible, terrible, oppressive people that are out there, tearing that down, and then we need to take power. And somehow, magically, mystically, um, once these people are in power, there's going to be peace and harmony and utopia. Yeah, that's not going to happen. We will duplicate. They will need to silence the voices of opposition. They will imprison. They will kill people. They will deport people. They will do all those things. Um, but it's more of a cultural thing, not a class thing. It's not an economic thing. It's not the worker class against the capitalist class as much. They do a little bit of that, but it's really more uh, the, uh, the white Christian conservative view versus kind of everybody else that doesn't really fit into that uh, boogeyman that they've created. And, uh, you know, this is where you get terms. You can watch our podcast on Christian nationalism. Ooh, so scary. Ooh. Um, you can go check our podcast out on that for more on that. But um, this is the kind of thing, the rhetoric that they're doing. If you're Christian, you're a target. I can promise you that. If you're kind of like a nationalist, and I don't mean like, I don't. I don't mean like this. The, the uh, socialist nationalists, sort of like the Nazis were. I'm talking about you. Just like, hey, here's a list of countries, and you live in the United States. Which of those countries should be your highest priority? Uh, the United States, <laughs> where my family is, where my people are. Right. That's nationalism, really, at the core. Your nation first, right? I don't know why that's so terrible or, or horrible, but. I mean, I, I can see why, like, you can get to where well, our nation should also conquer other nations. Well, that's that's now getting bad. But just the idea of we should worry about our own borders before we worry about the borders of Israel. Why is that controversial? Why is that controversial? And yet, it's a horrible thing to say, wait a minute, I, I, I'm not saying that Hamas should be able to come over and kill a bunch of Israelis. That's terrible. Is, Israel should have the right to... De Here's the, here's the key. Defend themselves, right? Defend themselves. They should have the right to do that. And as allies, if we can help them in that, great. But we shouldn't be spending a whole bunch of money, time, energy, effort, focus, all this on Israel when our own borders have gobs of people who hate this country coming through. Now, some good people are coming through too, I'm sure. I'm sure there's families coming through our borders that just want to be here, and just want to make a better life, want to work hard, want to make some money and make a better life. That's great. There should be a path for citizenship, citizenship for those people. We need a path to citizenship. We need something that doesn't take a decade for somebody to come in and be who we are. But we also shouldn't have borders where every person, whether you are that kind of person who loves America and wants to work hard, or if you're a, a bum who wants to live off our social security net, or if you're a, uh, a terrorist or some militant that hates the country, we're just kind of letting everybody in. Not cool, but that's kind of Marxism. Um, they're just ready to tear everything down so they can get into power. Next up, I, I mentioned Zionism. Don't confuse Zionism with uh, me saying Judaism. Those are not one and the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. Most Christians are absolute dupes. I'm, I'm going to admit it. I'm a Christian, and most of us are absolute, just complete clueless morons. We're du we are dupes when it comes to Israel. We think... Israel, we think Zionist, and we think, oh, people in the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, <laughs> right? That's who I, I tend to think. That's who you probably tend to think. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not think that, because um, if you're familiar with who Ben Shapiro is, then then you know who he is, but he's a political commentator. He's very, I mean, they, they've got like a hundred, I, I think it's a hundred million dollar company. I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly how big their company is, but um, let's just put it that way. But it's definitely t tens of millions of dollars. They're doing very well. Um, and I actually support the Daily Wire. I, I like the Daily Wire. I like some of the things they're trying to do, some, some children's content and get into the culture and push back against all the Marxist, wokest, woke stuff, right? Um, woke. Think woke equals cultural Marxism. That Those are the same thing. If you're familiar with that term, woke, then you'll immediately know who the cultural Marxists are 
in the United States. But anyway, Ben Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew. He is somebody who actually believes the Old Testament, goes to synagogue, believes in the one true God that I also believe in, worships the same God I do. He said that when it comes to Jews, many of them, if not most of them, they are secular, meaning they don't even believe in God. They're just secular. It's just a tradition. Um, and that's who I'm talking about when I say Zionists. People who are Zionists who are not also uh, true Orthodox Jewish religious Jews. Uh, and so you can be, you could not have anything to do with God. You can be totally secular, an atheist, and still quote unquote a Jew. When you look at the nation of Israel, the majority of people there, to my understanding, and based on right comments from Ben Shapiro, who, who would certainly know more than me, right? He's got relatives there. He's all in it. So the majority there are secular Jews. They're not religious Jews. They don't look at the Ten Commandments and go, man, this is sacred. Oh, wow, we're praying to Yahweh. They don't pray to anybody. It's all about money and power and influence. That's what it's about. That is not something that Christians should be getting behind. This is a force in the world very powerful, lots of people in business, in law, in politics, in media, and entertainment who are in this boat, in this camp, or are duped into giving that camp a bunch of money and, you know, sending resources and time because they think if you say Jew, that's somebody who believes, you know, in Moses and Abraham, right? So don't get them confused. You need to know when somebody says Jew or Israel or Zionist, what kind are we talking here, all right? Are we talking the religious kind that believe the Torah and uh, Yahweh and uh, believe and worship the same God and obey the same scriptures as me? Or are we talking somebody who doesn't care about any of that stuff but will certainly take your money? Third, we're talking about uh, Islamic extremists. Now, again, I have not done a deep dive study into Islam, People that have, that have really looked at the Quran and the Hadith, which is the uh, larger volume that kind of explains, you know, the imams and stuff from time past have explained and taken like verses in the in the Quran and stuff and like kind of built it out and explained what it means and how to apply it and that kind of stuff. That's the Hadith. This is my understanding. I think there's probably more to it. And I'm one of these days I'll do a deeper dive on it. But for now, I'll just say extremists. But though there are people who've done those, deep dives, and they say it's not that extreme. I've looked at different verses in the Quran and stuff and watched people give presentations. It's not that extreme for people to believe that it's okay to kill and to conquer and to subdue other peoples under Islam, under the nation of Islam, under the Islamic faith, under the politico-religio um, uh, structure apparatus that is Islam. Okay, and this is what they do. This is their stated goal. They absolutely want to conquer the world. Just go back. Listen, if you don't believe me, go back and look up, go to YouTube and type in the Ottoman Ottoman Empire. That is O T T O M A N and then Empire. And uh type that into YouTube, Ottoman Empire history, something like that. Um, they were moving across the globe where they were in their area. They were conquering. They were incorporating lands. They were uh, conquering Christian nations and enslaving their children and forcing them to go into um, Christian children forced into, I'm looking this up, Ottoman military. I forget the name. It starts with a J. Um... Oh, man. Uh, yes, here it is. The Janissaries. Janissaries. Um, go look that up. J-A-N-I-S-S-A-R-I-E-S, -S -S if you're looking looking for it. But if you go look up the Ottoman Empire, the history of it, uh, they'll, they'll mention the Janissaries because it was a popular thing. They would go into places. They would enslave uh, and, and dominate and kill uh, these Christian nations and, and conquer them. And then they would take their children and force their little children into the military to fight the wars of the Ottoman military, okay? This is what they would do. This was normal practice, and it's a historical fact. And today, they are the same. 
these Islamic countries are pretty much without exception. I'm going to say pretty much without, pretty much without, because I think it might even be without, <laughs> but if it's an actual truly Islamic nation, um, that, that, that is what they believe, right? And even when you throw in places that are supposed to be a little more moderate, like Turkey and these places, they at their core are, this is what they believe, folks. Um, look what happened in 9-11. This is not some, I don't believe it's some radical thing I can be convinced otherwise, because um, if, if you want to convince me, hit me up, let's chat. But the evidence throughout history seems to be that uh, Muhammad originally was about kind of like peace and getting along with, you know, at least the Jews and Christians. And then when they rejected him, he kind of turned and all of a sudden, uh, Allah is now not cool with them. And now we need to conquer them. And that, again, that's just kind of the historical. And then they become, it became a, um, uh, a religion of conquer, uh, and kill and, 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 and forcibly convert. Um, the, the very word uh, Islam means, you know, submission. Uh, I believe it's submission to the, like, the, the, again, kind of, well, it means submission, but it's like to, uh, to, to God, but it really means it's one who, one who submits, right? Uh, and then they, of course, so, yeah, but it means to God. It, it's, it's okay. But they, they mean we will come in and we will make you forcibly submit to God, or we will kill you and take your kids and make them forcibly submit to God. So what in the world? I'm <laughs> 15 minutes in now. What in the world can I possibly mean when I say that Christians can learn something from Islamic extremists, Muslim extremists, Zionists, and Marxists? Well, each of these groups has an ideology, a vision for the future, a, a even a utopia, something they're working toward here in the earth. If it's a secular atheist utopia, which, um, again, we saw that in the 1900s, and you can you can have it, bro. 100 million plus people dead, starving, tortured. You can have that utopia. If it's the Zionists um, and the things they've brought to the culture, things they've allowed, I mean, go look at Tel Aviv. Type in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, pride festival or, or, or LGBT, um, beliefs. They are like on the world stage, one of the most sexually perverse cities in the world. Okay. Open to all these things. And when I say LGBT, remember that leads to LGBT P for pedophilia, uh, B bestiality. Actually, they have a fancy word for it now. Um, that I, it's called zoo, zoophilia. Yeah, zoophilia. Yep, I looked. I wanted to look it up, um, just to be sure. But zoophilia. It does not sound nicer than bestiality. Um, and if you don't think people are pushing that, you're crazy. Go look it up. Um, don't get too deep into it though. It's really gross. Um, uh, polyamory, right? Multiple people. You know, ten people all getting married. I, I read uh, recently there was a um. Uh, there's there's a word. Oh, what is it? It's like sologamy. Is it sologamy or sologamy? I don't know. It's a solo with G A M Y at the end. So like monogamy. So maybe it's sologamy, um, or autogamy, which is when you marry yourself. Okay. This is the kind of future. This is the kind of world we will have with either a atheist Marxist utopia or a Zionist utopia. Again, Zionist meaning this is not people who believe the Old Testament, who follow the God of Abraham. This is people who are secular. Uh, finally, your option is Islam extremists, right? So again, what can we learn as Christians? We can learn that we need to be at the command of Jesus Christ, we need to be infiltrating the earth, moving into the culture, impacting, affecting um, the world around us, and not in our little separate 
sacred over here, secular over here bubbles. We need Christians. Now, when I say Christians, y'all know what I mean on this podcast. You know what I mean. I am not talking about fake Christians, gummy bear Christianity, like uh, Marcus Rogers calls it. I love that. Love that term. Um, you know, squish. No, no, no spine, right? Um, pick and choose what parts of the Bible they like and don't like, right? Secular. Um, Christianity, Western cultural Christianity. I'm talking about real Christians who speak truth in love, who call out sin, who love one another in community. And it's a family of believers who, when you pick up the book of Acts and you, and you go and read it, which, you know, again, many churches will tell you not even to read the book of Acts. It's just a history book. No big deal. Just skip right over it. Well, they want you to skip over it because you won't get more than about eight chapters in and you're going, why doesn't my church teach half of this stuff? <laughs> why don't we do any of this stuff that they're doing? Um, but I digress. Get into the book of Acts and look and see what the early church did. And again, uh, I'm happy to jump onto a podcast. I'm happy to have a phone conversation. I'm happy to converse with somebody. You disagree? All right, let's, let's chat about it. Let's see what points you disagree on. Let's see biblically um, where I'm wrong because I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you, uh, I know many, many people who have come from different denominations and faiths, and I ask them sometimes, and yes, they do avoid the book of Acts in a lot of denominations, in a lot of churches. They avoid it because they don't want people asking those questions. What about this? This seems to run contrary to what we believe and teach. What's going on here? And the reason for that is the book of Acts shows clearly that many, teach, many uh, Christian churches, quote-unquote Christian churches, teach false doctrine and are not living the life of the true Christian church out of the book of Acts. But what does that have to do with Marxism? I will tell you. Jesus said to go into the world, make disciples of the nations, and teaching them to observe, to obey all that he commanded. All right? We need to be in the earth as salt and light. We're not supposed to be a bunch of salt cubes in a warehouse somewhere, hoping that the earth comes and takes advantage of it. We are supposed to be out there in all aspects of society. Um, there is a kind of, I don't know, if, is it famous? Uh, that might be a, the wrong word to use, but there are uh, many groups that call these things the seven mountains of culture. I think that's a charismatic thing, but this is something that is not just o over in the you know the Pentecostal charismatic sphere. There are many people in many different denominations who teach and preach what I'm getting ready to say, and so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for people bringing awareness to this. But here are the seven different spheres, the seven different areas that I'm talking about: family, religion, education media, entertainment, business, and government. And the whole point is, you know, people will talk about the seven mountain mandate, or they'll talk about all of Christ for all of life, or whatever it is. But they're all kind of saying the same thing, that Christianity should not just be a personal thing in your personal home, and that's it. If you're a real Christian, it should creep out into what you do. If you're an entrepreneur, it should creep out into your business. If you are uh, drawn to uh, entertainment or uh, art and culture and that kind of thing, it should creep out. If you're an, uh, if you're a painter, if you're a songwriter, but you're a, again a true Christian, a true Christian, defined biblically. I don't have time to sit here for five hours going through all the different things, but if you're curious, hit me up, hit us up. Bread Breakers on uh, Facebook, not hard to find. Um, but you. You should emulate Christ. I'm not saying every time you sing a song, it has to be, you know, just nothing but the lyrics are nothing but Jesus, 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 you know, kind of like the, uh, what is that, the, the Princess Peach song <laughs> that Bowser sings, peaches, 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 peaches. It doesn't have to be like that, but you're glorifying God and what you're doing. Uh, and certainly the life you live, when people are interviewing you and, 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 hey, man, look at this great work of art. Look at this great uh, 
a sculpture. Look at this great building, this amazing, beautiful building. Like what, what inspired you? Hey, guess what? That's the opportunity to, hey, get the gospel out there in front of people. Uh, instead of some of these quote unquote Christian musicians who are, well, I'm more about positivity. I'm just, po what does that mean? Oh, you just be a good person. What does that mean? Oh, you're just supposed to be love. Okay, define it. <laughs> right? They like to use these buzzwords that mean nothing or actually, correction, they mean everything to everybody and therefore they mean nothing. You have to define biblical love, biblical goodness. Okay. And so that we need this. We need people in education. We need people in education, right? When the public schools are out there trying to trans all of our kids, um, and that might be a little bit of an overstatement, but not much. <laughs> uh, we need we need Christian teachers. Now, personally, I think the Department of Education uh, can just go up in flames, go bye-bye. We need uh, alternatives. We need places. We do this at our church, okay? Many churches do this, have church schools or things like that, uh, because we believe that they're... We want alternatives, private education, homeschooling, all these things, which they are going to try and take away, right? The Marxists are going to try and take all that away. You mark my words, not try. They already are trying. This isn't much of a prophetic word because it's already happening. But they hate homeschool. They hate private schools. They want to do away with those. They want to make it harder for those. They certainly don't want to give the same benefits to those, which if it's all about education, why wouldn't you want to? Because it's not about education, it's about control. Go back and look at Marxist ideology. Look at Karl Marx's uh, Communist manifest Manifesto. I mean, it's education is one of the major things that they wanted to take over because they know that's where you indoctrinate kids. So anyway, we need people that are in Christian co-ops or homeschool settings or private schools or church schools or whatever. We need Christians out there proclaiming the goodness of God, living a godly lifestyle, uh, teaching uh, teaching the scriptures and living the scriptures. We need that so that the next generation and the next generation and the next generation understands what it means to be righteous, to be good, to what love actually looks like and what it really is. Um, we need people in media Right? There, there's a huge one. Where, where are they? Where are the real Christians in media? Can you point them out? Who is the real? Now, I'm, again, I'm not talking about somebody that you know signs off with some prayer or something. I'm talking about who are the real Christian people at Fox News, at CNN, at MSNBC. Now, there's lots of people who are openly Christian on like YouTube and some of that alternative media. And I don't even think it's alternative all that much anymore. I think if you're watching Fox News and CNN to get all your news, you are oblivious to half of the real stuff that is affecting your life because they're not allowed to touch it. They're not allowed to go there. They're not allowed to report on that stuff. And even if they were, a lot of them aren't going to do it. So I'm not saying this isn't a place you can't get some general news and stuff, but I think if you really want to know some things that are going on, you have to do a little more digging than just turn to your favorite one channel. Sorry, that's just the way it is um, in our world today. I, I wish it wasn't that, that way, but we are living with... Uh, we, we are living with the ministry of truth, with the little memory hole things. That's a real thing. That's actually happening today. And so we need Christians in the media... We need Christians in business. We need men of God who are entrepreneurs, who are uh, hard workers, who are going out there and A, making money to give into the kingdom, but also taking the kingdom into their business. That They are kingdom from top to bottom. They are kingdom in their business model. They are kingdom at work. They are you know, living out godly principles. And why are we doing this? Here's the thing. Here's the thing that the Marxists have. Here's the thing that the... Um, that the uh, Muslim extremists have. They have a vision of making a better world. It's not just, well, yeah, do all this stuff, but it's not going to matter for today because, you know, it doesn't really matter because one of these days he's gonna Jesus is going to come rescue us out of here any minute now. Any minute, any second he's coming. And once you go study history, people literally have been saying that since Jesus ascended. People have been misreading the word of God. People have been misreading the words of Jesus. Oh my goodness, the, 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 the amount of misunderstanding in places like Matthew 24 or the book of Revelation, the lack of understanding that people have. And what does it do? It creates, it creates 
an attitude of what's it all for? Why even bother? We're, we're going to be out of here in no time. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, the world's just going to be a trash heap and God's going to destroy it. So what's the point? And if you don't believe that, you are a fool. That is what it births. Are there people who who look at everything in the future, Jesus coming soon, and still go out and impact the seven mountains of culture in a mighty way? Sure, there are some, but it's the exception, not the rule. I remember asking my old pastor one time, uh, if this was when I was about 18, 19 years old, and uh, I was trying to you know, rock the vote, get people out to vote, and I was encouraging young people. I was like, I w I'd gone and gotten my voter registration card. I was going to vote for the first time and this kind of thing, and I, I asked if it was okay if I do this and you know, get people excited about in the church about this, and he was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. You know, it's nice to see, you know, people are, uh, people are excited, people are doing some things, but, you know, it doesn't really all, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really make a difference because this has all been prophesied. That was his answer to me. That was his answer. This has all been prophesied. It doesn't really make a difference. And that's why many churches don't have any real cultural impact. They aren't raising up people who are creating, you know, companies like Elon Musk, right? Like Tesla or Apple or Microsoft, because it's like, no, let's just huddle up and just, just coast until Jesus gets here. And oh, what a drag. I have to go to this secular job. I wish I could just, you know, be like the Branch Davidians and hold up in a compound and pray till Jesus comes. That is not a biblical, that is, that is an anti-biblical mindset. And again, if, I, if you're hearing for this for the first time, you think I'm crazy, or you got friends that think this, send this video to them, and then I'll have a chat with them, if they dare, right? If their pastor would let them chat with somebody that actually, <laughs> you know, this is one of the things I, I find funny, is that people have opinions about stuff, but then they're either afraid or they're not allowed to sit and chat and talk with somebody that has a different opinion. Let's open the Bible, only the Bible, that's it. No books, no uh, no newspaper articles, no bylaws, just the Bible. Let's open it up. Come on, let's go. Let's go. But people are, A, afraid themselves. They self-censor because they don't want to have that, oh my goodness, I might be wrong, which guess what? We all laugh at an ostrich, but we all do that. Stick our head in the sand and pretend it's not there. It's still there, homie. The beast is still going to come and devour you. So because of fear that's self-induced. Second is because of fear that is uh, systemically induced. And I, I know lots of places, multiple denominations, different organizations. This is across the board. They control their people through fear. They control them through fear. You don't ask questions. You don't go outside and look at things. You don't dare reach out to somebody with a differing opinion who's willing to kind of, you know, answer some questions. You do. You better not. If you're having a conversation at a restaurant, you're looking over your shoulder. I have been there, Holmes. I, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Fear, self-induced. Fear, systemically induced, uh, indifference, apathy. These are, this is another thing. People just don't care. Just live their life, whatever. Ignorance is another big one. People don't even know. They're not even taught. They're not taught that we should go out and impact the world and impact culture and these kinds of things. They're taught just come, get saved, and then coast until you die or Jesus comes. And that is completely unbiblical. And so we need to start thinking like the Christians of old. Do you know it was Christians? Uh, the reason why we have so many hospitals and stuff in the world, you can thank Christians for that. Because Christians felt led and empowered because they had a mission. They had a mission to go forward and to impact the world. And so they came up with things like hospitals, universities, same thing. Scientific discovery, all almost without exception, it was Christians driven by Christian principles and Christian understanding. Now, somebody might say, oh, no, it was only because everybody was Christian and you didn't get funding. No, wrong. Sorry. You don't know history. Sorry. You're wrong. You're just wrong. You are just wrong. You're wrong. Sorry. You don't know history. Um, actually, it's people that have a 
biblical worldview that understand and believe something like the way things are right now, we can trust that they're going to be that way tomorrow. How can we trust that if we live in a completely random universe where universes just pop into existence like ours? You wouldn't be able to trust that. Science makes no sense. And again, this is why much of the scientific discovery over the centuries and millennia have come from cultures that believe that kind of notion, that there's a God who's in control of the universe and that we can explore the universe and we can create and we can do these things because we can trust how an orderly God ordered things. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that. I'm just saying, uh, look, just look at it. Christians of old had purpose. They were going into the earth, into the world to make this world a place that was welcoming to Jesus, where Christ is from sea to shining sea. We need to have more for our young people coming up than, hey man, you just need to get saved so you don't go to hell. We That is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is go and make disciples of nations. The Bible says, uh, you know, they turned the world upside down. Did they? Did they? Is that what we're doing? Or are we just kind of turning the couch upside down? Sitting there waiting for Jesus to come covered in Cheeto dust. We need to be people who have purpose, who have intent, who have mission, if you want to go to college and get a get a degree and impact, you know, corporate America, go for it and do it with the light of Christ and impact those companies and turn them into beacons of light for Christ. If you are an entrepreneur and you want to go and do it that way, do it that way. If you're like, "No, I want to go into education. I want to be a in administration or I want to be a teacher uh, at the college level, at the grade school level, go and do it, but be Christ to those people. Be Christ to the world. It doesn't always have to be with a microphone on a Sunday. Either you get to teach Sunday school or you can preach or whatever. That is the sphere of religion. Yes, we need that. It's critical. It's crucial. But we don't need everybody just clamoring for either that or your second option is you have to oh, have this horrible secular job and then just sit and soak until God comes. Don't do it. Have the missional mindset. We need a missional mindset, one that says, go and take the culture for Christ, not through, uh, not through extremism that is violent, but through extremism that is Christian, that is biblically based. That it, uh, You can be extreme. Let's go. Our culture is going to think it's extreme when you say, yeah, there's only two genders. Our, uh, nowadays, right? And you know why? Because our cult, because people weren't extreme enough to say no. There's only one thing. There's only one definition of marriage. There's only one uh, reason for relations, and that is procreation. And God gave us that, and it should only be with a man and a woman. People were too much. They weren't ex, quote unquote extreme enough to push that, and so that domino fell. And then people weren't extreme enough to push uh, no. There are biblical reasons why God made men and women. There are biblical uh, differences between a father and a woman, a father and a, and a mother, between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And these are biblical distinctions, godly distinctions, creational distinctions, and we should not overlap them. Men should be doing things God has called men to do, and women should be doing things that God has called women to do. Now, there might be some nuances. How do we work all that out? What's it all look like? Again, don't don't read into it anything more than what I've said, but what has happened in our culture is we've said, no, we're just cogs in a wheel. We're, we're, we're interchangeable, and nobody was saying, nope, that's not true. They weren't extreme enough. They weren't extreme enough to preserve marriage and say, hey, di divorce is not a thing that we want to be promoting or pushing in our country or allowing without absolute, let's look at this, let's let's um, really take it seriously, let's uh, rec have the bar high for people getting divorced, and for that matter, if you're going to get married, you need to have some understanding and some biblical, nope, nobody was extreme enough. Nobody was extreme enough to say things like, you know what? Birth control should be for people that are married. Now, the Catholics would say they shouldn't, they shouldn't be allowed at all. But I'd rather be talking between those two camps 
than talking about should we give it to six-year-olds should we hand it to our 12 year olds or 14 year olds at school right but why because their people people were not extreme enough when it was when it was first coming about people were not extreme enough to shout from the mountains why because christians too often are squishes and are just what oh we'll see this was all prophesied the rapture is going to happen any day now hoo, hoo, hoo. we're going to be out of here and then guess what then they wake up 40 years later and they're like oh my gosh my grandkids are living in a horrible world yeah one that you created homes so how about we get off the couch get outside get a missional mindset and start turning our culture around let's be extreme enough let's be extreme enough to change our culture for christ love you guys god bless you hope this has blessed you we'll catch you on the next podcast